Hello and welcome to Energy Lesson 5. This lesson is going to be on energy resources and it's the first lesson of two. So for the lesson you'll need a pen, some paper or an exercise book to record some notes in and to answer a few questions in. Unless you're needing to watch this video on your mobile phone, just make sure it's on silent or out of the way. Try and avoid any distractions that you can. So let's see what you can recall from previous lessons. In fact, let's see what you can recall possibly from year seven or year eight. So I want you to list as many ways of generating electricity as you can think of. See if you can give me at least five. So we're not talking about types of energy, energy stores like gravitational potential energy. We're talking about ways that we can use different resources to generate electricity. So I'll give you two minutes. Don't stop at five if you think you can think of more. There is a lot more than that. And if you've done that, you might remember the way that we divided them into two sorts of energy resources in year seven and eight. OK, should be nearly finished. Right, so we'll start building a full list of energy resources during the course of the lesson and you'll need to record those in your book. But the most likely ones that you will have put down there, coal, oil, gas, nuclear, wind, solar, are probably the most likely ones that you will have put down. So what we hope to do this lesson is, first of all, we're just going to describe the main energy resources, try and remember a decent list we're going to divide them into different groups, two groups initially, and we're going to compare the energy resources that we've got, mainly in terms of reliability, but we will look at, at other factors as well, pollution, whether they're renewable or not. OK, so what are energy resources first? So we've developed technology over a long time that allows us to do work. In other words, we could use energy to make things, to cook things. So, for example, burning wood in the right way can be used to extract copper from ores and then you make bronze tools. So we need to get that energy from somewhere. And initially we would have used up the chemical energy, the store of chemical energy inside wood to get that energy from. So we might use them in the following ways. We, we need them a lot for transport cars, trains, buses, we generate electricity with them and we use them for heating houses, keeping us warm. We're going to look at the main energy resources now and make a call on whether they are renewable or non-renewable and that should ring a bell, you should remember that. The pictures represent the main energy resources. There you go, so we've got 10 of them. 
they should remind you of an energy resource. Some of them are renewable, you can use them over and over again, or we can easily replace them. And some are non-renewable, they'll run out, can't easily be replaced. I want you to state the main energy resources available on Earth using those 10 pictures and label them as renewable or non-renewable. There are a couple more that aren't in the pictures. If you know them, that would be absolutely fantastic. So I'm going to give you two minutes. Thirty seconds. So there's his pictures. So first picture on the left represents wind, so we can get energy from the wind, and that's a renewable resource. It doesn't run out. Hydroelectric, you might have called it water power. That picture there is a dam. So we've got water that's going from a high place, so it contains a store of gravitational potential energy, and then it flows down to a lower place, getting kinetic energy store would increase there as it goes down and then we can use that to generate electricity so that's renewable we're not going to run dry we use that water we can keep using it wave power so you're using the up and down motion of the waves to generate electricity that's renewable the waves that we get um, are mainly due to, to wind so it's coming from the same place as that energy then we've got down the centre, we've got coal. So that's a fossil fuel, if you remember, from year seven and eight. So it's formed when we've got um, dead animals and plants being covered over and squashed. It takes millions of years to form. If you can't remember fossil fuels, I'm not going to cover it in these videos. But if you go down to, I think it's the year seven video on YouTube, you can have a look at, at fossil fuel formation there. Oil, another fossil fuel, because it's a fossil fuel, Again, that's non-renewable, takes millions of years to form, so it's not easily replaced. And natural gas is the same, so that's non-renewable. Got radioactive symbol at the bottom, so that represents nuclear power. So that's coming from the energy stored up in inside unstable atoms. And it's pretty much uranium that all nuclear power stations use now. And that's non-renewable, it has to be dug out of the ground. We've got quite a lot of it left, but it will run out. Next picture, it's representing the moon there, and the moon is mainly responsible for our tides. So twice a day we get a high tide, twice a day we get a low tide. So those, the water moving because of the tides, you can trap the water and run it through a turbine, a bit like a dam. That's renewable, you get it twice a day, 
it's not going to run out. Solar power, again, it's renewable, it's not going to run out. There's a couple of ways we use solar power. You can use it to heat water or heat black panels and get the thermal energy, or you can use what are called photovoltaic cells, where we directly turn light energy into electrical energy. And the last one is a volcano there. So geothermal, that's where we're using the heat under the ground to heat water and steam. We can generate electricity that way, and that's renewable. Now, you can either make a note now if you want, or you could wait to the end of the lesson, because at the end of the lesson in the summary, I've got a full slide that summarises everything. It would probably be worth pausing the video at the end and getting a full set of notes on there, because you need to be remembering that so you can recall it. Relatively easy marks if you've remembered it in the exam. A couple of others you might have put down, biomass and hydrogen fuel cells. Biomass, if you've put wood down, burning wood, which is a, a way that we've been heating houses and keeping ourselves warm for a very, very long time. When we're, we're burning something from a living thing like um, trees or fermenting ethanol from crops using fermentation, we call that biomass. And hydrogen fuel cells is generating electricity from hydrogen. So why do we need them? Well, I've got three main ways here. So most of our energy resources are needed to generate electricity. Uh, the modern world is powered by electricity. In the past, almost all electricity was generated by burning fossil fuels in a big power station. That started to change. And in the UK over the last few years, it's changed quite a lot. So there's a little flow diagram there. We've got coal so we've got chemical energy we burn it so we get heat we heat water into steam and then we use that kinetic energy to drive a turbine and generate electricity you won't do the physics behind our turbine and a generator work in making electricity until year 11 when we do the magnetism and electromagnetism topic we also need energy for transport Electric cars are more common, but the vast majority, 90% of cars on the road, are petrol and diesel cars. So they're still using fossil fuels. Petrol and diesel um, come from crude oil. We also need a lot of energy in factories for, for making products, for making things. So, for example, we need energy to extract iron and we need that energy as well to turn the iron into steel to make products. So... That's the main three ways that we need energy. Heating homes as well. Some homes are heated by electricity, but quite a lot of homes are heated by natural gas still in the UK. So I'm going to talk about this word reliable now. Some of the energy resources are reliable and some are unreliable. So let's make sure we're clear on what reliable means. So reliable means they're generally constant. They'll keep generating electricity. If you've got a friend who's reliable, you can count on them. So if you say to your reliable friend, uh, I'll meet you at the pitches, I'll meet you outside at eight o'clock, your reliable friend is going to turn up and they're going to be waiting for you, maybe even five minutes early outside the pitches. Your unreliable friend is told by the mum and dad that they're not allowed to go and they forget to tell you. So you can't count on them when you need them. So unreliable energy resources might rely on the weather or unpredictable, uncontrollable factors. So an example, wind. Wind is unreliable. It can be unreliable. It can be fantastic some days and non-existent on others. So some days you'll see the wind turbines. There's bound to be some somewhere near your house they're not rotating so they depend on the weather so now we're going to play the spot the reliable and unreliable energy resource see how the way that i made it seem much more exciting than it really is there so all i want you to do in two minutes is to go down the list and decide whether each one is reliable or unreliable remember reliable means you can count on it day in day out unreliable 
you're going to have some problems with it. You can't always guarantee it's going to be working. Two minutes. Okay, be quick if you haven't done. Okay, time's up. Okay, let's see how you've done, and hopefully you've got more than half marks, because if you've got half marks, well, you can't get exactly half marks, you've been guessing. So, coal's reliable, you can count on it day in, day out. As long as you've got enough of it in the ground, it's reliable. Oil, the same, reliable, it's there, day in, day out. Natural gas, reliable, same again. Nuclear, reliable. So the four non-renewable resources there we've got an advantage that they may be non-renewable but they are reliable so solar solar's reliable if you're in the right location so modern solar cells it doesn't really matter if it's cloudy they will generate electricity during the daytime but if you live in the uk and you you're wanting solar power to be working in winter you've got very short daytime hours during winter so yeah solar is reliable the sun's always there but it might be a bit limited by location wind so wind is unreliable if it's windy fantastic if it's not windy you've got no electricity geothermal it's reliable but again it's limited by location geothermal is not a great solution in the uk you need to be able to dig down into the earth to find where the heat is. In the UK, you'd need to generally go down quite a long way. Countries like Iceland have got a lot of geothermal resources. They can go very small depths into the ground and get huge amounts of geothermal power. So much more suitable for their location, but it is reliable. It doesn't depend on the, the weather or anything else. Hydroelectric again, unless of course you live in a country where you have um, potential droughts. But if you're damming huge rivers and generating hydroelectricity using those, it's reliable. Tidal's reliable. You can use the water when it's going out, when it's coming back in, and then when it's going out and coming back in again, because you get high tide twice a day. So you've got four times per day, so it's reliable. Wave unreliable you get times when the sea is very calm and you also get times when the sea is far too rough to generate the electricity it will even damage the machines that you're using to to capture the energy from the waves biofuels reliable so you could have a forest of trees you could cut them down and you've got lots and lots of wood 
And then as long as you're replacing them, it's a renewable resource as well. We've talked about renewable and non-renewable. We've talked about reliable and unreliable. Now we're going to look at pollution and energy resources. Burning fossil fuels is polluting. They all contain carbon. Burning them will produce CO2. That's an oxidation reaction. Combustion is an oxidation reaction. So you've got carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. So it contributes to global warming. When you're talking about fossil fuels, you can always talk about carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. Now, burning coal and oil, which have tiny traces of sulfur in, will produce sulfur dioxide, which is very acidic and soluble. So sulfur dioxide will contribute to acid rain. When you talk about the pollution from coal and oil, talk about sulfur dioxide. Now, the nitrogen in fossil fuels will also produce nitrogen oxides, and we call those NOx gases, and they're acidic as well. When you're answering a question about pollution, talk about CO2, talk about sulfur dioxide, talk about NOx gases. And pollution is always going to be a disadvantage of using fossil fuels. There are other sorts of pollution as well. You could describe a wind turbine as visually polluting. Some people don't like the look of them. You might describe wind power, the wind turbines as being noise pollution. If they make a noise, you live near them, you don't like it. I'm going to give you four minutes now to use what you've done already in the lesson to put down at least one advantage and one disadvantage of using each of the 11 energy resources. After about a minute, I'm going to put down a bit of a hint. So if you're struggling, it should help you to fill in quite a few boxes. Many of you will be able to have a couple of disadvantages and a couple of advantage for a lot of them. Four minutes. Let's give you a hint then. If you know that an energy resource is renewable, that's always going to be an advantage. If you know that it's non-renewable, then you've got a disadvantage. And likewise, reliable is always an advantage. If you know that coal is a reliable resource, then you've got that as an advantage. Pollution, well, that's always a disadvantage. A disadvantage. If you can, do talk about a particular type of pollution, though. Be a bit more specific.
Just a minute left. Let's see how you've got on. A reminder though, there is a summary at the end which you can use to just help you with some better quality notes. So don't worry if you're missing a few things on here. Let's start with coal, oil and gas at the top. So an advantage of all three of them is that they're reliable and a disadvantage for all three of them is that they are non-renewable. Also, you've got the disadvantages for pollution. You could put produced carbon dioxide which contributes to global warming for all three of them. You could mention sulfur dioxide and acid rain for coal and oil. Nuclear, disadvantage is it's non-renewable. An advantage is it's reliable. You do have the disadvantage of nuclear waste. You'll cover more about that in a later physics topic. So all the rest of the list there, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, are all renewable. So that's one advantage you could put down for all of them. Now, some of them are unreliable. Uh, wind is unreliable. Wave is unreliable. So that would be a disadvantage. You could talk about geothermal. A disadvantage would be you need to be in a specific location. Biofuels, that's one that you might have struggled with. So you've got your advantage, it's, it's renewable. Disadvantage, you need quite a lot of land to be growing them on. If you're growing trees and you're going to cut those trees down and replace them, then burning the wood, you'll need quite a lot of land and it's land that you might really need for growing food on. Right, the last new thing that I'm going to introduce. This topic has got quite a bit of content that you will need to read over to make sure you've got to grips with. So use the keywords. The keywords are your indicator of the, the main bits that you need to be testing you've got in your head. So this is the last one. and This is a new thing. Base load. So we've got a graph there and that graph represents the amount of electricity on the y-axis that we need at any particular time. So the higher the line, the more electricity that we need, we need in the UK. And it represents a typical UK summer's day. So you'll notice first thing in the, well, midnight, zero. We've got just over 30,000 kilowatt hours that we need in the UK. And that goes up and then it's sort of flat during the middle of the day. And then we've got a peak uh, in the early evening and then it starts to drop back down again. So the highest demand there is at eight o'clock in the evening. That's in 24 hour clock, 20.00. So that's the red line on the graph. So just before eight o'clock, most people are using electricity. Lots of people are using it, just putting the lights on at home, TVs on, some people will still be cooking, Xboxes, Playstations, using all the electricity all over the country. Lowest demand at midnight, so two places on there at the very beginning and the very end. So at midnight, we've got a lower amount. And it's not exactly, but about half what the peak demand was. 
Now, the problem we have is we need a certain amount of electricity and we need a certain amount all the time. But there are extra times during the day when we need more. So we need to be able to very quickly get extra amounts of electricity. But we can get extreme examples where there's something happening, a World Cup final or something's happening nationally, where you get a very big demand. So we have a lot of electricity supply that's on standby. So we need certain resources that can give us that standby. So we need two types of electricity resources, really. We need the one that we can have on all the time, and that's called the base load. And one for extra electricity at times of higher demand. So on that graph there, that lump there, the blue lump, the rectangle I've just put on is your base load. Day in, day, in, day out, we need that amount of electricity. So we always need that. But we'll need other energy resources that we need to switch on for the extra bits. Now some energy resources are great because they can be switched on and used really really quick. So that's called a startup time. So the amount of time that you need before you can have some electricity, that's the startup time. So coal, 120 minutes. So that is the amount of time it's taking for your furnace to get hot enough that you can start producing steam. You know, if you happen to have a coal fire at home, it's not the fastest thing at getting going. So 120 minutes. So that's not much good in an emergency. But natural gas is, because that's only taking you three minutes. Gas fire lights pretty much straight away. Wind, two minutes just for your turbine to be switched on and reach full speed. And nuclear well, shocking, it's taking four days. Some bigger nuclear power stations take longer than that. So nuclear is absolutely useless for giving you quick electricity when you need it. So what we do in the UK and most of the countries is we pick the ones that are great for the base load. So coal and nuclear, we've been using for, well, towards 90 years now, we've been generating electricity, certainly from coal, nuclear a bit less, using those. So they're the base load because they're reliable, but they need a long startup time. So they're switched on all the time. So our coal powered power stations and nuclear power stations, they're on all the time. They give us this base load. And then other ones like natural gas and wind, we can use those for extra electricity because they've got a short start-up time. Okay, so let's give you a couple of questions just to check that you've got it. So question one, what, did, what do most households do in the country at this point? So we're talking about football match. It's 2-2 after 90 minutes, whistle goes, extra time, 10 minute break. Yeah, it's not usually quite 10 minutes. So what do most households do at this point? So we're trying to look at a scenario we might have a bit of an issue with electricity. And if we can't sort the issue, people will end up having the electricity cut off and you'll have a power cut. So I'm going to give you two minutes to do question one, two and three.
Okay, just 30 seconds left. So, whistle goes, people have got 10 minutes, they've been sat there watching it, so what would they do? So, put the kettle on, make a cup of tea, they might bob into another room and put a light on, they might want to grab something to eat, toast maybe, pop it in the toaster. So what you'd find is a lot of people would suddenly decide to have an electrical appliance on, plus the whole country would have the TV on, so there was probably a lot of electricity being used already. So question two, which energy resource would be best choice to guarantee that this peak in demand has met? So natural gas would be pretty good, three minutes, or if you've got wind power that you weren't using, you would use that. Problem with wind power is because it's unreliable, it might not be windy at that point. What the national grid, that's the whole the whole set of wires and everything across the country that's that's delivering electricity to your home they use computers to work out when this is happening so they can act very very quickly and also they try and predict when we're going to have problems as well if the weather is particularly cold that's going to cause problems potentially as well so question three what would be the best choice for the base load so we've talked about this the base load the best choices would be coal or nuclear or coal and nuclear. Potentially you'd use both. That would be the best situation. Right, I'm going to leave you with a summary. Now, there's quite a lot of information here. If you've not got this, I do recommend that you record this. You'll need to pause the video to give yourself long enough. But it's quite important. And although the exam questions aren't very difficult, you do need to remember the content of this. Otherwise, you're going to struggle. Some of it's common sense. Some of it isn't. So get a, pause it. Get a record in your books. And I'll see you next time where we'll be looking at some more applications and the way that we're using energy resources.